fifth episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, on this uh, sort of solemn Sunday night? Welcome to another live episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And this evening, of course, is all about the victims of the Moscow murders. Very hard to believe it was one year ago uh, come tomorrow. I, I can't wrap my head around the fact that it has been that long. But in fact, it has been. Uh, we're going to talk a lot tonight about the victims. Kaylee Gonzalez, her best friend, Maddie Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and her boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, gone way too soon and obviously a huge impact uh, on the town of Moscow, Idaho, um, forever scarred by this heinous uh, murder. So I'm uh, going to welcome in our best guest tonight. Uh, one face is probably very familiar to you in the bottom right corner. That is Ted Rollins, uh, Court TV anchor before joining Court TV. Ted worked for over 20 years as a correspondent for both CNN and ABC News, where he covered some of the most infamous trials in history, just to name a few. O.J. Simpson, Michael Jackson, Jody Arias, Scott Peterson, Robert Blake, Phil Spector, and the list goes on and on. And he is also a managing editor of Court TV's in-house documentary unit. And they prepared something special uh, for uh, the one year. Um, I hate to say anniversary. That implies some sort of celebration. But the one year since uh, these murders took place. Um, then the rest of the crew, um, Amanda Johnston. She was born and raised in Moscow, Idaho, bottom middle of your screen. She is proud new mom to a baby daughter. She graduated in 2021 from the University of Idaho with a bachelor's degree in sociology with a criminology emphasis, which is interesting as it pertains to this case. She also minored in justice studies and communications. Cindy Hollenbeck, I became friends with her through this show. She was a member of STS Nation. She graduated with an MFA in creative writing from the Univer uh, University of Idaho and is the communications director for the Washington State University Grad School. Uh, and of course, we know that that is where uh, the man whose name I will try not to mention tonight, who's suspected of killing uh, these college students, that's where he went to school. And uh, she has three children and two dogs. Cindy begrudgingly moved to Pullman last year after 20 years in Moscow. Then you've got Linda Moser. Uh, she is a Moscow native, born there in 1963, her family were all Norwegian immigrants who farmed the Genesee Valley in the early 1900s. She lived in a bunch of cities, but moved back to Moscow in 2003. And uh, she currently works in the academic department at the University of Idaho as an administrative coordinator since 2016. So Linda, Cindy and Amanda, very closely tied to the community. And then, of course, J. Ruben Appleman, uh, who is a true crime writer. He's the author of The Kill Jar. He joined us not long ago. Uh, didn't think he was going to make it, but uh, he has made it to or near the Moscow area. He's going to be there for the memorial tomorrow night uh, on top of The Kill Jar, which also became a Hulu series called Children of the Snow. He has a new book out right now, While Idaho Slept, uh, While Idaho Slept. So welcome uh, to one and all. Appreciate you being here. And I'm going to start with our, our Moscow um, friends here. Linda, can you, and you reminder, you're muted, but can you wrap yep. your head around the fact that this happened a year ago tomorrow and what is going through your mind tonight? It, it is, it just feels like it just happened. The, the, the grief in this community is very apparent. Um, we had just had the beginning of a new academic year and everybody's all excited about starting classes and everything. But there is a somber tone. Maybe I should speak for myself mostly. For me, there definitely was a somber tone to the beginning of the academic year because there's four people who who are not here. and But they're immortalized at this university. They call it the Vandal family for a reason. The Idol Vandals are a very proud family. And, and these four beautiful young people will never be forgotten. They're working on a memorial on campus and they're going to enlist students help for ideas, how this will be done. 
and orchestrated and everything. And I plan on going to um, the memorial tomorrow evening just to show my support and love for these people. I didn't meet, I've never met any of them, but most everybody on campus knows, either knows them, knew the families or knew somebody who was very close to the families. They're very, very connected to the University of Idaho campus. Uh, Amanda, you just graduated in 2021, um, just prior to the to the murders. Uh, your reaction when you first got word about it and now your reaction a year later? You know, I will actually never forget when I got the notification on the Vandal uh, text message system just because yeah. I st was still, you know, under that. I was a student just a few years ago. And I read it and I immediately was like, oh, man, like something's going down at the University of Idaho uh, because nothing like that ever happens. You know, it's not a town or a city where we have a whole bunch of social disorganization. It's everything's pretty mellow, pretty peaceful. So to get a notification, you know, of everyone basically stay indoors uh, for people are victimized. It was it was pretty shocking. Um, and it it's to this day i think hard for people to even comprehend that this went down in our small town in university of idaho because everyone is a close close community you know we're just we're vandals <laughs> we don't we don't fight we we just go to school we hang out downtown there's nothing really violent in moscow and so for this to happen it was absolutely shocking and, and i I'm sorry, Amanda. I, I didn't mean to cut you. You were done with your thought. But when you got that text message, was it uh, first of all, was it a text message? And was it was it basically informing you what happened, but also a, a shelter in place message in essence? Yes, correct. It was the Vandal alert system, which. Went to school there, but it, I mean. I guess I just never really removed it from my notifications after graduating. So, yeah, I even though I graduated and moved away, but. I still received the vandal alert and it was yeah shelter in place uh for victims you know uh, it was really shocking and scary um you know and then you get more details of it four students died and they released the names and you're like wow like what what happened um and to this day we still you know don't have that much information about what exactly happened and i think that's part of the the d disconnect everyone's kind of feeling in Moscow is, you know, we lost four beautiful souls in our vandal community, and we have vaguely any kind of information about it. So, you know, we're, we're, yeah, it's a very solemn kind of anniversary. I'll just say that. And uh, you guys are all getting kind of an inside feel of what it is like in Moscow, Idaho, a year later. Cindy Hollenbeck was in Moscow for 20 plus years, originally from New York State, and now is in Pullman, of course, where the man suspected of this. I'm going to try not to say his name this episode. I'm going to do my best. But uh, the man suspected of this was going to school there. And um, Cindy, your thoughts and feelings one year later. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess I, it, it, it doesn't, and it does feel like a year. Um, I've been following it, as you know, Joel. Um, interestingly enough, Joel had me on his podcast the day before the arrest. Like, it was the weirdest coincidence. Um, when I first heard about it, uh, I had only heard that there was one victim because the news trickled out, and... Um, I have a really close relationship with my ex-husband. So he was the first person I told. I said, there's a, there was a murder in Moscow. And he said, really? And I said, yeah, this is so strange. And then more news came out that it was four. And I was like, this is like crazy. And my first inclination was as the news came out, um, I, I just, I just kept picturing it exactly how it turned out. I was picturing it as this person in black that had gone in and ex I'm not going to give the details because we all know what they are. It was exactly what I pictured. So I was locking my doors. I was terrified. Every time I went to Moscow, I was like panicked. And then Joel had me on his podcast and um, 
we texted and I texted Joel a message and I said, I really hope they catch this person. And Joel said they will. And the next morning, my daughter, Jessica, sent me a message and said, mom, they have an arrest. I mean, Joel, it was the weirdest thing. So thank you, Joel, because Joel <laughs> made me feel good. But um, yeah. And then, of course, I found out that he was a grad student from WSU where I work. And so I immediately told well, I got a hold of my um, one of my closest colleagues there, and I said, "This is one of our people." And then, um, I mean, it, it was that it was just it's just so strange because I've been um, somebody who uh, my daughter Jessica also is the one who used to make me watch Forensic Files and Dateline, and I was like, "Why do we? Why do you watch this stuff?" And then I started watching it because I am um, I don't I don't like the gore or any of that part. But I I'm, if I was ever going to be a lawyer, I'd be a prosecuting attorney. I would never be a defense attorney. I like the puzzle. I like watching them build the case. And so I started watching all that stuff. And then when this happened, I was like, wow, I, I couldn't. I, I mean, I think I got in really big trouble at work because I for six months I was obsessed with, you know, catch this person. Um, and then when uh, Chief Fry came on and um, you could hear the his voice shake, um, I don't know if you want to call it with excitement or with emotion that there was a, you know, the suspect was caught. And then just, um, I know I go on forever, but I'll, I'll close up after this. I'm a very big, um, uh, I'm a Moscow Moose member. I've been a member for 14 years and Chief Fry came into the Moose Lodge I don't know, about four months ago. And when he came in, I just like went, you know, celebrity bananas on him. <laughs> like I was like, chief friend. I ran over and I hugged him and told him how amazing he was and how proud I was that um, even with the whole world thinking they'd never get him and that Moscow was a podunk town and, uh, you know, didn't the police didn't know what they were doing, even though they had the FBI and the Idaho State Police behind them. I told Chief Fry, I said, you are an amazing human being. And I got a selfie with him. Um, so even though it's been a year, you know, and uh, yes, it's somber and yes, it's awful. At least we can say, you know, seven weeks after, I'm guessing this person thought they could outsmart the police, but they did not. So um, I hope that justice is brought for all of those families that lost their their beloved, wonderful, um, loved ones. And uh, Ted Rollins, I'm going to have you take the baton from there with all due respect to everyone on the panel. Typically, I would go to uh, Ted Rollins probably first. He's a big, uh, big time anchor. Core TV's got a special coming out. But uh, Ted, uh, for a long time, immediately after these murders, people were coming down hard on the Moscow PD. They didn't think they, the little engine that could would ever solve this case, but clearly they did, and they did it in a pretty uh, uh, amazing amount of time, as Cindy just said, seven weeks. Uh, were you surprised by how fast they caught this perpetrator? Well, yeah. I mean, think if you do, if we would go back to those six and a half weeks, it was excruciating, right? It felt like years of like, why haven't they caught somebody? And once you, you now know what they knew at the time. In fact, we did an interview with Bill Thompson, prosecuting attorney, a couple days afterwards, and he did tell our Chanley Painter something. He said, you know, she asked him, would you have your loved one or child come to school here while this guy's on the loose? And he said, I would. Uh, it's because I know a lot more than everybody else. And they had that knife sheath from the very beginning, and it gave them time. It gave, They had a case. While we thought, oh, my gosh, they don't have anything, and who knows who has done it. They had a quiet confidence about them, and to your point, they had the FBI behind them. And the way this came together was extraordinary because it was it was the video canvassing. It was finally hitting that DNA match on the knife sheath, and it was you know then his phone because they found out from the video canvassing in the Washington State. You know the cop ran the plates. Now we got a name, and guess what? He was pulled over in um, Moscow, and he gave them his cell phone number boom they got the phone he turns it off i mean the whole thing was 
as clean as you could ask for from what we know. Now there's the gag order. So there's more there. Um, so as far as chief fry and, and the way that this small department, Oh, and, and by the way, Amanda, it, it doesn't just the, the country was shocked, not just you guys. You're cause our, it, these, this doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in the big cities. I've got two kids at uh, the university of Alabama. It doesn't happen there. Four kids dead while they slept. They didn't do anything wrong. And uh, they ended up dead. And, and I think the country is uh, mourning still. And, and this, this um, uh, Joel, I, I appreciate you not calling it an what, whatever this marker is, this one year. I think uh, uh, people around the country are taking a big sigh and thinking about these families that uh, I, I can't imagine what they're going through. Even a year later, uh, they, they just lost their beautiful children. But um, I digress. It is, a, it, is a, it is a time for all of us to pause and, and think about what has happened there and, and what we have and, um, and how lucky we are. But, and, and, but also hats off to not only the Moscow police, but the FBI and state police. They did a fantastic job. Uh, Dr. Von Decay, I'm going to circle back in a minute to Ted to have him tell you about the special that's going to be airing tonight on Court TV, and then we'll re-air uh, specifically about uh, the one year since these murders uh, occurred. Dr. Von Decay, thank you for doing this tribute to SGS, and thank you to Court TV and Ted Rollins for remembering them too. Uh, Becky Ireland here uh, to our next guest. Listen to uh, J. Ruben Appleman's book on Audible, an excellent book. While Idaho slept, thanks for writing it. Uh, Jay, I know you were out of pocket most of the day because you were headed to Moscow. Are you there now? And what are your plans for the next day or so? Yeah, I drove up uh, five and a half hours from Boise and uh, I'm here for the vigil tomorrow. Um, I also just sort of out of respect, uh, every time I'm here, I just tend to go to the to the King Road house. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear people talk about the... Um, alleged perpetrator, which clearly, it, it, if you're paying attention, it looks like like he's good for it. Um, uh, but I, I never really decided to, I never wanted to write the book about uh, who did it, really. Uh, it was mostly about how communities uh, repair from this type of violence that visits them. Uh, and and um, I like I like what he said. Um, what did you call him? The big time anchor? <laughs> I like big time anchor. Yeah, I like I like what I like what you said about uh, this being the, the marker. It made me think this is the first marker on the road toward healing, uh, like a mile marker, so to speak, on, on the, the long journey. And, you know, it, it's um, it's really troubling, obviously, what happened. Um, I'm really interested in how communities repair. And um, it seems like the neighborhood itself, I was just there, um, is is still sort of reeling from it. Uh, there's still looky loos driving by the house. Uh, there's still uh, camera uh, men setting up their tripods uh, for their for their shot, um, and it's it's um, it's troubling. I know a lot of people want the house to remain through the trial, as as I do. I think it's the sensible thing. But as soon as they can get rid of that house, probably the better for that community uh, immediately around that neighborhood. I mean, and um, and and um, it feels like everybody is. Uh, uh, wanting to move into that mark that beyond the first marker, you know, but it's, it's difficult to figure out how to do that, um, without resolution to the case for sure. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at photos here. Uh, that's Maddie and Kaylee, and then you've got Ethan and Zana. Um, just so sad. We'll get into each of their kind of individual stories a little later in the show, but just back to the big time anchor. We won't keep calling him that because I'll probably start to blush, but Ted Rollins. Uh, so he does have a special coming out on uh, court TV this evening called the case against try not to say his name tonight, but you know who um, Ted, what's, what's the special all about and uh, how long has it been in production? We have been uh, working on it for a, a few months and it's sort of a culmination. It's a combination of, um, looking back at what exactly happened, looking back at the lives of uh, the students. And it's also looking forward to what we know about the case uh, against the defendant and what potential defenses there could be. It seems like an open and shut case from the, that probable cause affidavit, which just read like a crime novel and uh, 18 pages. I mean, normally a probable cause affidavit is tiny. 
and you don't get much. They laid it out. And um, you look at that and you think, wow, I don't know, this is open and shut. But we've got a couple of people on the special that argue that um, there's there's potential openings for the defendant and that, you know, and true, everybody does um, uh, deserve to be presumed innocent. That's our, how our country works. So we look into the, what we know what about the case and then also the victims. Airs at 8 o'clock Eastern tonight and then the re-airs tomorrow at uh, 7 o'clock Eastern. And that is on Court TV, so please check it out. Um, let us know what you think. Look at this, Rose K. I'm going to the memorial for Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and Ethan Monday night in Moscow um, with my big sister and dad. Rose K, surviving the survivor at gmail.com. Please uh, reach out. Love to get your thoughts about uh, how it was after the fact, of course. And um, Jay Rubin talking about, you know, looky lose and uh, the media will descend and be in Moscow again. Ted and I know that. Was, I'm a former broadcast guy. Ted's still a broadcast guy. And, uh, it's our job. Hopefully uh, the media will be proper as they normally are and uh, won't be too overbearing uh, when they get in there and the, the, they will know their place and uh, allow the families to grieve because um, that is definitely necessary. Um, just trying to pop this off here. Uh, COE, I don't know why we're going to a black screen. There we go. Um Joanne Murdoch, Truth and Justice, Rosanna, Ethan, Kaylee, and Maddie. Um, Linda, back up to you. I know you were kind of hesitant about whether or not you, you know, plan to go tomorrow. Uh, I'm just curious, and I, it might be personal, but, but why the hesitation? Is it just too difficult? Um, is it something you're just trying to? I, I, I just was. I've been affected really emotionally by this because I'm a mother, and these. Young people are the age of my children. And so, and it used to be anytime I would drive around one of these little memorials around town, I just would, would break down. And it's just deeply affected me on my job too, because I remember an early um, uh, press release, a press, press conference with uh, University of Idaho President Scott Green, and he tried to say the names of these students and he just broke down and couldn't even speak. It was, and I'll just never forget that moment seeing the president of the university, just who's a man who's not, it doesn't have a hard time speaking publicly, but he broke down and could barely speak. And it's, I, I think that I can handle the emotional impact of going to the memorial. Um, but I've just, I hesitated a little bit because it's just very hard on me. I am just a very empathetic person and I'm a mother and I'm a university of Idaho employee. So it, it naturally hits me pretty deeply. So, but yeah, absolutely. I will go. I, I really coming to this podcast and sharing here and talking and uh, with everyone here makes me realize I shouldn't hesitate. I think that it's a good thing to do for be part of our community. I'm very connected to the community and this is just a, a a way of showing love and respect. So definitely. Yeah. Well, el eloquently said, and Amanda, I think one of the things that shook, not just Moscow, but the whole world, one of the reasons, and I'd love to get your guys take on why this story has captivated literally people around the globe. I think one of the reasons is just the, at the time, the seemingly, seemingly randomness of it. Um, it just happened to four innocent college kids there was no real connection at the time, and it felt like anyone and everyone was vulnerable in the same way. Uh, do you think that's part of the reason why people were sort of so freaked out by this? Oh, definitely, especially with the fact that so many people do exactly what they were doing. You know, they go out at night, they go to the grub truck after the bars, you know, and they walk home. I've been one of those people, which is part of the reason why I felt so like hurt and I I mean I hate to keep saying shocked but really it, it was just so mind-blowing I was like wow like I've done exactly what they have done you know I go out with a friend leave with a friend stop buying some food with the friend you know and they were even better they even got a ride back to their house for safety and you know I would just walk home <laughs> with my friend and it, it was just, it makes you connect to them more because you have been in their shoes on what they were doing. And 
it, it's just it's sad you know it really is uh cindy by the way a bunch of people saying they recognize ted from ktvu ted Rollins, a great reporter been watching him since his ktvu days very cool to see him on sts um cindy can you just for those of us and it's almost everyone who have not been to moscow idaho um you know we've heard about the mad greek restaurant what is the city of moscow like just kind of walk us through there um if you can describe it i'm happy to tell you and um oh it's so great the very first time i ever came to moscow it's probably about 1990 four, uh, maybe a little bit earlier. And the very first place I ever saw was tie dye everything. And, um, I grew up, as you said, in upstate New York, my dad owned a shoe repair shop and, uh, he was a hippie. There was paraphernalia in his shop and his, uh, employees sold, uh, made tie dyes. So I grew up in a very bohemian culture. So when I came to Moscow the first time and I saw tie dye everything, I was like, wow, like this is my place. <laughs> and then um, there was just this very welcoming atmosphere. And um, I went to school in Lewiston, which oddly enough, our quote unquote, well, we'll just call him perpetrator. The perpetrator drove down there and went to Albertsons, um, bought some stuff, which we still don't 100% know. But this area is incredibly familiar to me. Like, I know this area like the back of my hand. So I went to college in Lewiston at Lewis Clark State College and um, would come up to Moscow all the time. It's 45 minutes. And Moscow has, um, well, obviously, my Moose Lodge is in Moscow. I sent you a picture, Joel. And it's right next door to the Corner Club, which if you come to Moscow and you don't go to the Corner Club, you might as well not make the trip because the Corner Club <laughs> is the place to come, okay? We've also got Hodgkin's um, Drugs and Toys. It's this really cool place. You can go down in the basement, and they have, like, all the stuff for your, like, quote-unquote nerds, you know, all the, like, um, games that are for people that, like, the, the I forget what they're called, but, like, the, the off-the-beaten-path games, not Monopoly, but the, you know, their stuff. And then, you know, we've got... Um, Amanda's favorite place, Casa Lopez, um, where my daughter and I go, they have, um, I mean, it's just a strip, at, you know, downtown and the whole town is only four miles, like the perimeter. I mean, I walked it one day just for the heck of it. Um, it's incredibly friendly and it's, um, it's, it's very eclectic. And I don't say that in a cliched way. I mean it in and maybe, you know, it's it's in the book. Um, we've got this very, like, rigid Christian group. And then you've got the very liberal group. But we somehow live there harmoniously for the most part. You know, like, it's very interesting. And Idaho is a red state, but Moscow's like this little patch of blue. So I think that there's a statistic that when Al Gore was running for president, Moscow was responsible for like 70 poor, 74% of his vote in the state of Idaho. Like it's just a really different place. So, um, uh, you know, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. And I know that crime like this can happen anywhere. We know this. Uh, and if you watch any show, they'll say crime like this just doesn't happen here. I think um, I think that it can happen anywhere, which is super unfortunate. It's just that when you come to a place like Moscow, you're welcomed, you know. And so what makes it so shocking is that when it does happen, you're like, and I think Mr. Gonsalves has said it. And I really like that he said this is like, you don't come here and kill our babies. Like, you know, <laughs> we are a place where you are welcomed and treated well. Um, you know what I mean? And it, it's that's what makes this so tragic. And you said it, Joel, so random. It's like we we welcome you. It's a wonderful place. And that's what makes it so heartbreaking. It's like, why would you come here and do this when we're wonderful people? You know? Well, well said, Cindy. Courtney says, I live in Virginia and I had to sleep with the lights on for months after this happened. 
Can't begin to imagine how people felt in or around Moscow, followed by this comment from Lil Bit, a super sticker. I have three boys, and my youngest was 20 when this happened and still at home. I just couldn't imagine. I'd become very invested and probably in a very unhealthy way. So sad prayers for everyone. But Jay Rubin, this previous comment reminded me when this did happen, um, and I live in a very safe neighborhood with the COE, but we were checking our doors. I remember getting up. I never really checked doors. But after this crime, Jay Rubin, I was because I said to myself, wow, if it happened in Moscow, it could happen in my hometown. Do you think that's part of why people are so riveted by this story, Jay? And uh, what's what's it like for you to be back there tonight? Well, three things in there. I, I always sleep with weapons and my lights on and things like that. Um, not not every day, but very frequently. These stories lead me to leave the bathroom light on or to take that knife out of my closet and stick it under my pillow. Uh, uh, but um, I think what I think uh, uh, is it Amanda in the middle? I, I'm just getting. I, yeah, Amanda. I yep. Cool. Um, I I think that. Um, she touched on something that, that these this is thing these are things that we did we went out like this we did this we did that i think what's interesting about this case from the sort of the the frenzy standpoint of it all when it first happened is that uh the victims looked like the people who drive social media traffic in the true crime space um they they the, the true crime, uh, sort of the online cyber community, let's call it, or the cyber sleuth com community, or the true crime community, um, many of them uh, are in that demographic, that age bracket, uh, and and uh, after years of being primed by uh, Netflix specials and podcasts on true crime and just the whole true crime um, frenzy in general, they sort of learned how to investigate crimes a little bit, even though they might not have gone to uh, criminology school or have natural investigative acumen, they, they learn certain things. And then the victims, just timing wise, after a decade of, of, um, of all of this sort of background in true crime uh, from, from streaming things, um, the victims then looked like them suddenly. And, um, and without, a, without a, a perpetrator, a known perpetrator, um, there was all this, this vacuum, this space to start trying to figure things out, right? And a lot of it was because it was horrific. It was horrible. It's our worst nightmare, like everybody has said. In the middle of the night, a stranger. I mean, this is horrific, right? But also, there was some element to this that was like people wanted to people wanted to help to figure it out. So there was like a common task involved, and that that sort of built on the frenzy um, and and mainstream media, which is fantastic. We need mainstream media. Uh, they took notice, I think, from social media and and. You know, it kind of snowballed like that to me. Um, that's what I see in it is that the victims looked like the people uh, who drive the traffic. And um, and that's why it took it, not, which is not to say they shouldn't have millions and millions of eyeballs on this case. They should. Um, I just think that that's why it was driven that that, that quickly. But um, what's it like there now? Uh, I, I think, um, you know, I talked to somebody in the neighborhood. Uh, I said, I, I said, um, how does it feel uh, lately with all with the traffic? I was talking about the traffic with with the media posting up or looky loos as I call them or whatever. Um, and she said it's the same. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, it's it's not there's not 20 people out there uh, every day with cameras and, and lighting kits, but there are still one or two that show up on a daily basis, more or less, and the sort of psychological trauma of the of the neighborhood, uh, the inherited trauma uh, of the community um, still exists. You know, there's all these little reminders. And um, um, I think it's 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 a, like I said, 10 minutes ago or whatever, it's there's going to be a long road toward some sort of community healing. Um, uh, the security guard that I talked to there said the same thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's people here every day. Uh, he called it a tourist destination. Um, He's one of the U of I security guards. And um, I think that's really telling so sociologically. I think that's telling what, you know, but I think it also is telling of the fact that uh, most people are, most people who go there are going there because they want to share in the healing process or because they're, they're mourning as well uh, because they have inherited some of that trauma. And um, they're not all there just to do like, like the abhorrent TikTok dances that were happening in the first um 
a couple of months that occurred there. Uh, they're not there for that, really. They're there to pay respects, mostly. It's just a difficult thing for the neighbors to keep seeing. So that's sort of the general vibe of, of the neighborhood right now, for sure. And that is good color about what's happening there. Now, that is a photo of the cover of J. Reuben Appleman's book, While Idaho Slept. And uh, I have my own copy, and it is available right now uh, anywhere books are sold while Idaho slept. Um, Ted, there's a bunch of comments here. Uh, this is one of them. Um, thank God the house is still there for evidentiary purposes. The house is evidence. And uh, I'm going to get back to you about something completely different revolving around DNA because you were quoted in the New York Post um, just today about DNA. But as it pertains to the house, FBI was back there um, just this past week. They were doing com measurements and 3D modeling. Um, it is now owned by the University of Idaho. But just from your past experience covering cases, how big a mistake would it have been to have raised this house prior to this trial, do you think? Well, I, you know, I think that it would have been a massive mistake to raise the house before they went in and did the 3D imagery. Um, I think it's a tough call because it is a, it's just a, a, a reminder, constant reminder for the people there. And, and I could see why they, people would want it done, you know, raise it and move on. But, you know, you talk to Steve Gonzalez and, and other family members, they're saying no, because you, you might, you, is, is it better to have it and, and possibly have a jury view there, bring the jury? Absolutely. And um, so why take anything to chance, even though it is um, a horrible daily reminder for those uh, people that live near it. And I'm sure the whole, the whole university and the small town, but um, I, I think the right decision is to keep it. Um, if they don't, if they, it, it's not a game change. It's not a killer. I mean, if they, if they, it's not going to kill the case if they don't, because th that imagery is compelling and you could show it to a jury and get a very good feel for the house and the layout. Um, but why not keep it? Yeah. And uh, there's talk that jurors could go there Maybe the FBI is creating models where the jurors won't have to go there. Um, you know, Ted, while I have you, one of the sort of interesting things that's painstaking for the community is there was supposed to be a trial that was supposed to begin last month. But now there's no trial date set. Um, emotionally, how difficult do you think that is for the community? And then we can ask some community members. But what, what's your take, Ted? Well, you know, the community, I think, is a case by case for the families it's excruciating um we part of our special was riding with steve gonzalez in kaylee's land rover on her birthday and oh, he and his family i know all the families were very upset when um the defendant decided to waive time uh, from a practical standpoint this is a four a quad murder death case the odds of it ever going to trial that quickly were minuscule and um but it's excruciating for this family and as uh steve said he said let's get it on let's go um and it is hard to if you put yourself in those families position this is a major wake up every morning and you think about it you think about justice and the fact that you haven't gotten it yet and you have to wait and you and that's the way our system works but it is the hardest thing for victims uh family members and it plays out in, in, everywhere in this country every day so um tomorrow night 7 p.m uh local time there is a big memorial service planned um Students from three different Greek chapters are who are associated with three of the victims. They're going to speak. Uh, Amanda, to you, um, I forgive me because I already forgot if you said you were going or not going. But, um, you know, what do you think the response to this is going to be? Do you know Moscow better than anyone? Is there going to be a massive outpouring? Are people going to you know flood over there uh, to be a part of this? I actually do think people are going to flood the admin field is where it's being held on campus. And this was truly touching for everyone. I mean, it impacted the whole Vandal family and even further, you know, there's probably going to be people who weren't even on campus coming to this vigil. And I, I mean, it, 
they had to move it to the Kibbe Dome last time. It was so big and the weather wise, and even that was pretty full. So I do imagine some a lot of people will actually show up to this vigil that's going to be held on Monday. Um, I mean, this is a tough anniversary. It really is. And, and Linda, are people, you know, I imagine, you know, as with anything, after the initial shock, it kind of wears off. But leading up to this one year since the uh, murders, are more people talking about it again within the community, just in day-to-day -day conversations? People are talking about it more now because we are at this year mark from this happening. Um, and it's it's a it's a, dis a topic of discussion. What's going to happen with the house? Speaking of which, I have to admit I was a looky loo. I'm sorry, I'm going to admit it. I I want because, and this is I hope this is not off topic, but I wanted not at to all. go. I took some flack for it too because it's like that's really Linda. That's really morbid and that's really disrespectful. But uh, what the reason that I wanted to go. Not to, I didn't set foot anywhere on the premises. All I wanted to do was drive around behind the building because, and I, what I didn't realize that you don't get from the video footage and the photos is how concentrated there is of people in residence there. It is, it is a lot of people in a very small amount of space. And what I wanted to see was how close is the back driveway to the home itself? Like, and I just drove up and all I did was park behind it. And I got out and looked and you, the, it's just feet away from basically the doors and windows of the back of the residence. If you were there in the dark, listening, watching, you could hear anything that's going on. You could see inside the house very easily. I wanted to see that for myself, you know, and, and I didn't mean any disrespect and I didn't bother anybody. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just took a look and I left because this is so impacting and you just want to go there to feel a part of this such impacting thing that happened in the community. And so I just felt like for my own understanding, what the scene looked like and how close, how close can you actually get to that house without even going inside it? Pretty darn close. And that was really shocking to me. Um, so, you know, this is this is just part of my trying to process this. Um, but yes, it's talked about a lot. It's talked it's talked about a lot. There's a lot of online forums. Some of them I don't want to get involved in because they're it, you, you see almost the worst in people. There's a lot of disrespectful, unkind things being said. So I, it's like I don't participate in online forums. Forums like this where it's respectful. And, and, and people of, of educated status that understand these things um, discuss this. And this is the kind of forum I want to be part of. I don't really want to be on a massive online worldwide forum where everybody's talking about it. I really want to keep it more personal, um, more thoughtful, and I want to learn something. So I'm learning from this forum right now, and I want that book, by the way. So while yeah. Idaho slept, I'm going to go back to Jay Rubin yeah. um, right now. Jay Rubin, uh, do you think that I know you're not a psychologist, but you're a private investigator and an author and you talk to a lot of people. Do you think that um, for the people in Moscow, Idaho, and you said just out of a sign of respect, you stopped by the 1122 King Road home. Do you think it is, um, you know, it's uh, I don't want to say a form of therapy, but uh, something that people, you know, just want to attach to since it's such a big part of this story, obviously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, when it first happened, I wasn't even planning to write a book. I, I came up here and I, 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 I say things like looky loo just as a, like a way of describing something real quick, but, but I totally understand. I came up here just to be in the space where it happened to sort of um, pay respects to sort of, um, I, I, this might sound, uh, uh, extra a little bit, but to, to be in touch with the dead in some ways, like, you know, you see those trees along the highway and you see flowers planted by the, or, or hanging on the tree where somebody passed away. And, and sometimes you want to stop there. You want to touch the tree. You know, um, it's a, it's a recognition that we're, we're not here for a very long time. That's what those markers are for on those trees to tell people that pass by, Hey, this could have been you. Um, come love, come love this person who died here. And, um, and, 
at, at, at its best, these these types of situations offer us a way to live our lives better, the ones who are still here living. Um, and, and if we don't pay attention to those, if we don't stand by those grave markers, we don't visit the, the crime scenes, so to speak, um, we miss out on something, I think, a little bit. I think a lot of people are there to, to be in touch with, with the horror in a way that helps them live their lives better. Um, and, and I think other people are there to assist with the mourning, to recognize what happened and really fully process it, to understand what they're hearing in the news, to go to the back of the house, so to speak, you know. Thank so you for saying that. Yes, but, thank you. But, but in, in, in any situation, it's also like a metaphor to go to the back of the house and see what other people saw. You know, um, this, this is re a really important process that we all have to go through and we all mourn and, and suffer in different ways. And um, absolutely, I, I think that's why most people go to the house for sure. And uh, Ted and I are always taught not to use cliches, but out of the darkness and the evil, sometimes uh, there comes light. And uh, I think the Moscow community is an example of that uh, from this horrific crime. Um, they've come together. They're going to come together tomorrow night. Pam Hart Young writes, hello, my STS fam. One year, my daughter lives in Moscow with my grandson. I was speaking with her on the phone when they received the initial text, like Amanda was describing, to shelter in place. This channel has been a shelter. I don't know about that, but thank you. Uh, and then you've got this comment, just seeing absolute fear in the UI students after the murders and packing their cars to go home to mom and dad, not knowing if the killer or serial killer in the area. Um, also, we didn't imagine one person doing this. Amanda, you're kind of nodding your head in agreement. Uh, do you remember feeling that way and, and looking at the students and thinking the same thing? Oh, yeah, it was absolutely scary because we had no clue. I mean, who would go and do that? Who just enters into a house? I mean, Moscow is a community where you, you know, leave your door unlocked. You don't really imagine someone coming in and hurting four people. Um, so, I mean, rightfully so. I would pack up everything and leave, too. I would encourage my children to do so until the, the culprit was caught. It's just absolutely scary horrifying you know it's the community was not resting well after everything that went down i'll just say that mm. uh rose k who's in moscow and is going to go to the memorial i'll reach out let you know about the memorial justice for kaylee maddie zana and ethan and prayers for their families i know their families could certainly use that Carolyn A, what got me was the innocence doing everything right and the vulnerability while they slept, which uh, goes to the title of Jay Rubin's book, While Idaho Slept, is the title. Um, Cindy, back to you. We talked about this, and, and then I kind of want to go through each victim. Um, Ted, you know I want you to stick around the whole time, but you've got your big show at eight, so if you have to jump at the top of the hour, you just let us know. But um, Cindy, to you, there's still no trial date uh i don't know how jolting is that and problematic for people living in moscow and in pullman that there's no future closure in sight at least not yet well um a lot of times i try to talk to my friends and the ones that aren't as uh interested in this as me <laughs> i don't get a good sense however um I think that um, the people that I do talk to, um, it is it is kind of interesting that uh, somebody said the other day, like, the trial has been postponed indefinitely, is one of the things they've said, right? Uh, yeah, that is correct. Okay, and so it's like, um, okay, um, hmm? so hearing something like that makes uh makes one think that maybe there's not going to be justice and then for me personally when i hear things like um and i was just talking to someone about this yesterday things like um the uh, uh the defendant the defendant said um Oh yeah, I just uh always used to go out in my car and drive a uh, drive around at night you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm sorry, but to me, this stuff sounds absolutely preposterous and ridiculous. And so it, it's that kind of stuff that makes a, a certain level of frustration. And um, 
I don't know. It, it, it feels like, you know, when is this going to happen? And I realize it has only been a year and there's some, you know, some that go on for much longer than that. And the fact that this person was caught so quickly, I think probably gave us all a sense of hope, like, oh, wow, this is going to happen, you know, but um, some members of law enforcement um, that I've spoken to are like, you know, oh, you know, there's not going to be a trial for a really long time. So don't, you know, if that's true, fine. As long as justice is served, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, um, you know, all of us have been talking about like how the families feel. And I'm just going to get really personal here for a second and say, when I was 18, my older brother got killed in a motorcycle accident. I couldn't say his name for two years without bawling hysterically. Like I just was so close and loved him so much that I couldn't talk. I couldn't say his name without crying. And I know that losing a child is not like losing a sibling. I can't imagine that pain. It's different. I know it's different. So th what these parents are going through just right now, they're in absolute shock. The, the grief hasn't probably even really set in yet. And so my heart just goes out to them so much. And I think, I hope we can get justice for them sooner rather than later. But I mean, I, you know, Joel, I don't know. It's just got to be absolute frustration. And um, I think it, is it Jay? Or, I think Jay said it. Uh, maybe it was, Tim, I don't know, one, some person said, waking up with this every single morning, like you go to bed at night and you sleep and you think, oh God. And then you wake up and you're like, oh, the, it, it's not a dream. It, it, it is every morning, every day is a nightmare for these people just having to live through that pain. And so I'm sure it's just absolute frustration. Yeah, that's what the families are dealing with. Uh, she Jukester, Ted Roland, awesome. You're on. Can't wait to watch your show. And now it's about six minutes away on Court TV. Uh, tears flowing. I need hugs. Um, <laughs> Ted, um, what I mean, just to kind of put um, a little more context, you've covered so many of these high profile cases. What do you think is really behind the um, the fact that there is no trial date right now, that they've got this suspect in custody, it keeps getting pushed back and back and back. And now there's nothing to look forward to on the horizon in terms of a date. And, and you know what? The, there easily could be a date that in this case, they just didn't, they haven't put one. A lot of times in a, in a death case, especially, but when you've got, a lot of moving parts don't throw out a date you know i uh, think of the daybell case you know chad daybell his original uh, date was this or that and it what it does it gives people sort of sense like okay well, he's going to trial the date never it, the dates always come and go is the problem and in this case i think that the parties are acknowledging that this is a very complicated and they are i mean the defense is coming hard this is um you know Ann Taylor is, is a fantastic attorney and think what you want about defense attorneys. They're taking this and they're trying to attack every bit of it along the route. It's going to take a while because it's a death case. Um, so could they have a date May of next year? Absolutely. And, but they, they all know inherently, well, we don't know if we're actually going to hit that. So let's not even put one down. Um, so I think that's part of the equation here. It's not that they're saying, we may never go to trial. Uh, this this is going to trial. You guarantee this is going to trial, and uh, and it, it'll be next year. I mean, it'll be next year at some point, likely spring or summer. But you can't delay indefinitely. And no matter who your defense attorney is or what your strategy is on the defense, at some point you are going to stand trial, uh, and this is what's going to happen with the accused here. And I hope that brought uh, some modicum of comfort. Um, Carrie Fox, uh, I was in Walmart around 1 p.m. in Moscow. A college student walked up to the cashier and said something is happening over on campus. And I think there's somebody dead. So people uh, recalling their own personal stories of where they were um, that fateful day. Uh, Mind of Monsters, justice for Ethan, Maddie. Sana, Ethan, thank you for keeping their memory alive and not saying his name tonight. Much love and respect. So let's just kind of go uh, to the victims themselves. Uh, Ethan Chapin, and uh, I will put up uh, 
uh, the CO will put up a picture of Ethan. He's with Maddie there. He's a, he was a 20 year old, a triplet. So his sister, Maisie and brother Hunter, they all enrolled at uh, UI at the same time. Uh, he was a freshman majoring in sports management, a member of the Sigma Chi fraternity, uh, and they will be present at the Memorial Vigil tomorrow night. Played high school basketball, and his former coach said, he lit up many of my dark days, days when maybe things weren't rolling for me. Ethan comes in the gym, and all of a sudden, everything is meaningful again. And then there's a quote from his obituary, uh, and it says, since attending the University of Idaho, Ethan lived his best life. He loved the social life, intramurals, and tolerated the academics. He also continued to play sports. Uh, Amanda, to you on this, uh, you're closest in age to him, uh, one of three, a triplet. I mean, this has to just be agonizing for, for the family. Um, what's it like to just think about him, Amanda? It's it's hard. I mean, I was reading on the story of, you know, the other two siblings coming back to campus after this happened and how difficult it was for them. And quite honestly, I admire them for being so brave for coming back and moving forward because I, I don't know if I could, you know, losing a sibling in this way at your home base, you know, University of Idaho is their home. And it's just, it's hard, you know, it's hard for the families. It's hard for everyone on the campus. And I honestly, I truly admire the families for what they're going through and their bravery and them moving forward. A little bit. She brings up a good point. I would feel my safest knowing six people are around me. That in itself is mind blowing. Um, Pam Hart Young, Moscow is an amazing little community, quiet, unified, peaceful, beautiful. Moscow is an awesome piece of land and people. Joel uh, V. Louise Arthur, uh, almost finished your book, J. Reuben Appleman. While Idaho slept, it is excellent. Check out the uh, the book. Um, so that was Ethan. Zana Kernodal, of course, his girlfriend. She was 20 years old, an Arizona native. Uh, you see her there on the right side with Ethan. Um, she was a member of the Pi Beta Phi sorority, majoring uh, in marketing. Uh, again, she was dating Ethan. Her sister named Jasmine described Zana as being lighthearted, the kind of person who always lifted up a room. Her direct quote is from Jasmine Kernodal, you rarely get to meet someone like Zana. Her sister said uh, in a text message, she was just so positive, funny, and loved by everyone who met her. Linda, your reaction uh, when you think about Zana and uh, how vibrant she was? It is, you know, I want to keep the memory of these beautiful young people uppermost in my mind. And that's one reason why I will be attending the memorial and showing my love and care to these people. But it is, the images of these people are so beautiful. This is a worldwide like a phenomenon now that they've captured the hearts of the entire world. And, and that is very fitting. These people are just glowing. I mean, these people were just in beginning the, the prime of their lives. And it's just remembering them is the most important thing right now. And they will be remembered. They'll be immortalized on campus and in all of our hearts. And we will probably I imagine we will have, you know, Memorial yearly in their, in their honor. But I, and I wish I'd met these young people. I, I, a, a very good friend of mine knew uh, some of the students that were from Post Falls and knew them, um, knew them personally and knew about what happened. And basically before it was even released to the public, um, how the things happen and how they came about because a lot of people were talking about it before it even was released. Um, yeah. And it's very poignant. It's very deeply touching. And I grieve still, you know? Yeah. I think, I think we all do. Uh, Ted had a bounce. His special right now is going to be on court yeah. TV. Uh, and then it's going to re air tomorrow multiple times. Uh, Zana Kernodal, I think in her high school yearbook, talked about the lives that she's going to change. She obviously meant it as a, you know, a young person going to college. Uh, that life was cut short, but she's going to change lives, no doubt. 
um, just in a very different way. Uh, the other victim, there are two more. Kaylee Gonzalez, 21, a senior. She's at Alpha Phi Sorority. Um, they will be represented tomorrow night. She grew up in northern Idaho, practically sisters with Maddie Mogan. Um, she said about Maddie on social media, I wouldn't have wanted anyone else to be the main character in all my childhood stories. I love you more than life. My best friend forever and more. Uh, she had plans to travel to Europe and move to Texas. Uh, her sister, Olivia, said about Kaylee Gonzalez. She had everything going for her, absolutely everything. She had her job lined up. She had worked really hard for it. Cindy, it just hurts because these lives were just getting going. Did you want me to talk? Yes, please. Okay, yeah. I'm glad you you chose me for these because um, I, I was most struck um, when they talked about, uh, and they said this initially about how they, um, they had shared, um, shared a bed because anyone who knows what it's like to be a girl <laughs> and back me up here, ladies, when you have a best buddy, you sleep with your best buddy, you know, you just do. I mean, doesn't matter if you're, uh, Four, 14, 24, 54, whatever. I mean, that's just what women do. We cuddle with our best friends and it's, it's both tragic and it's both incredibly sweet. So um, I think Linda talked about it earlier, like these um, people that get on certain, you know, forums and make, you know, not nice comments about, oh, why were they in the bed together? They're in the bed together because they were best, best, best friends. Like they were like siblings and that's just what you do. And to see how close they were. Um, and I think Steve had said it, you know, um, they were super close in life and they were super close in death. And I'm getting the chills even saying it. It's, it's both tragic and it's both really, really heartwarming. Um, you know, the fact that Kaylee was just coming back to show her vehicle, like, hey, look what I got. You know, um, obviously they're all they're all on the precipice of, uh, you know, life. And I wanted to mention one thing, Joel, when you were talking about Ethan um, and his mom and they have the Ethan smile, you know, um, tulip that they got now for him, just that, uh, how much grace his mother has shown, like how amazing his parents are that um, I think that we could all learn a little bit of grace from how amazing his parents have been through this whole thing. I, I mean, all the parents are dealing with this and it's awful. It's just anytime I listen to his mother talk, I think, wow, I could really learn some things from Mrs. Chapin, <laughs> you know, uh, how kind she is and how, um, just how wonderful she always is whenever she talks. And um, like you said, we're, we all learn um, from these awful things. And if I can be a better person just from listening to her talk, I think that that would be a monumental thing in my life. Uh, well put. Caro, I didn't even say his name tonight. She's cautioning me. Alleged, Joel, alleged. Obviously, we do know that uh, the suspect in custody is the alleged uh, perpetrator of these crimes. That's why we have trials in the United States of America. And there will be, as you heard Ted Rowland say, uh, there will be a trial and it will likely be in 2024. Um, Nick Spunky, one of the more generous members of SDS Nation. I'm hanging out with my boys right now. Cannot imagine losing either one. I think that is a common denominator among all human beings. Never imagine losing a child. That's just not supposed to happen. Uh, it is everyone's, uh, you know, to use a cliche, but it is accurate. Worst nightmare. Um, final person here, but obviously uh, not least, is Maddie Mogan, 21, a senior, a marketing major. She also was in the Pi Beta Phi sorority. Uh, she worked at Mad Greek um, along with Zana Kernodal. Uh, they, she grew up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, um, and had plans to move to Boise. Jay Rubin, 
it just so I mean, it just crushes your heart. You know, these are people again, just in the prime of their not even in the prime of their life, just getting toward the prime of their life, um, really just going out into the world on their own or getting ready to go out into the world on their own. I know you reached out to a lot of families um, in writing your book while Idaho slept. Uh, what did you, what did you learn in terms of your contact with these families? Well, yeah, I reached out, of course, to everybody I, I could find numbers for or contacts for, which was almost everybody in terms of the immediate family. Um, very few of them spoke to me uh, for obvious reasons. They're in the middle of their morning and I'm uh, a guy they don't know, right? Um, but uh, it was really important to reach out to them because I was writing the book and and to give them an opportunity to add to the book. It'd be the worst if I had written the book and and hadn't even given them the grace or the, the opportunity of, of saying what they wanted to say, right? So yeah, I reached out to everybody. I did speak with uh, uh, Stacy Chapin briefly. I talked to Christy Gonsalves briefly. I talked to um, Ben Mogan briefly, and I talked to uh, a close family friend of, of, of the Kernodals. And, um, you know, all of them, uh, we, you, 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 we talk about how Stacy comes off really well in the press and what a great woman she is and everything. True. Every one of them was really great and grace, graceful with me and treated me with great respect. Um, they didn't have to. Um, they could have hung up the phone with me. They all treated me really well, um, understood what I was doing, um, and were kind to me in the middle of their, their worst months, uh, which is a, really a testament to all of these, these families. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned Maddie just now. I, I have this visual of her, her mother um, accepting uh, the, the uh, degree on, uh, on Maddie's behalf and at, at the uh, commencements in May. And um, she's holding on to her, her husband's arm. Uh, and it, 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 it's, um, and, and in other pictures you see of, of Maddie's mom, she's always holding on to his arm at these events um, that are uh, memorializing their children. And um, you can tell uh, that if she lets go of that arm, she's going to fall. Like that's the that's that's the feeling that she needs that she 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 needs that arm, and that's a really heartbreaking thing to see. Um, it's like when you stand on the side of a boat that's tipping and you're holding onto the rail, right? Or if you're on the subway and you're holding onto the whatever they call that that grip. Um, that's how she's holding on to uh, Steve. I think is his name, right? Um, her her husband. Laramie, maybe I'm kept, I'm drawing a blank right now, but um, uh, it, it's heartbreaking to see them in the press, uh, uh, and yet they're so graceful for doing it, uh, like like going on that court TV show that that's airing right now. Um, they don't have to do that, uh, um, but when they do it, they're so amazing. They're so giving in the middle of their pain, and that's just really something to think about. It's we all can learn from that for sure. Uh, well put. Again, I'm not going to say his name tonight. Adam Lamparello with a $20 super sticker here. In my view, uh, he went from PA to Washington because he was stalking one of the victims. Ultimately, he got rejected or ignored, decided to kill her, but never anticipated encountering four people. Um, there were six people in the house. Yeah, it's uh, people still trying to figure it out. This is something that I always think about. Sunflower Girl, great channel. Joel, it's really eye opening. That nothing else has happened in that town since the perpetrator has been caught. Uh, interesting thing to ponder. So, Amanda, to you, uh, I think you mentioned this right off the top. The school, the University of Idaho, is working on a permanent memorial site that's going to be called Vandal Healing Garden and Memorial. They've been working with students to create a permanent place to honor their lives, as well as other students who died too young. Uh, the dean of students about finding a space on campus was quoted as saying, we're hoping to identify space on campus to build a memorial garden and healing space for students, employees, and the community where we can come together, where we can grieve the loss of our lost uh, vandals. How important, Amanda, is it to have a place on campus to go to? Oh, it's extremely important. I mean, I think the last kind of crime that went down that really impacted our campus, uh, they created a bench for Katie Benoit. And she unfortunately uh, was attacked by a, a teacher, a student teacher, I believe. 
um, from just a bad relationship, but, you know, we dedicated a bench so that way we always remember. And we, I do believe we have a yearly vigil as well, just to remind everyone to stay safe. You know, we are a vandal community. We are a vandal fan family. And having these kind of memorial areas is really important to have. Um, and from my understanding, I think we're planning the memorial garden where the house is once they demolish it but i mean i could be wrong about that uh linda uh the garden as i said that they're going to eventually build is going to be dedicated to all enrolled students who never lived to see graduation day so far through donors they've already raised um over two hundred thousand dollars in the university's <laughs> college of arts and architecture uh they're going to be in involved in the design process with, with students, um, there's a quote here, and I have to be honest, I think it's from the dean again. We were able to identify a couple of places on campus that we thought would make sure a good spot for a garden. There were some considerations that went into that from the committee, including an area that has some sort of seclusion, privacy, quietness. We don't want it right in the heart of campus. This is a place to go and reflect uh, hmm. You know, I'm from New York, New Jersey. I was in Manhattan on 9-11. Obviously, they, you know, built uh, huge reflection pools. But how important is it to have a place in Moscow that you can physically go to to think about these victims that were killed back on November 13, 2022? Well, um, it, of course, it's very, very important. And I, I'm not sure what place they're really talking about. I haven't heard anything that specified a particular place. Um, I was thinking the administration building lawn, but if they don't want it in the center of campus, that's probably not the place that they're going to put it. It could be on this. I don't know about the site of, of the murders being a good place for that. I don't know. Um, but you know, the, we do have that big arboretum, the Shattuck Arboretum, Ar Arboretum that's right there. I mean, there's, that's a pretty big, vast space. They could possibly do something. That's just a little bit off campus. It's right on the edge of campus. Um, so that could be, and it's forested. It's very beautiful. That It's such a quiet, wonderful place. If you need a place to 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 reflect and, and gather your thoughts and feel peaceful, you go to that Arboretum and you just take a walk through there. Every season in that Arboretum is beautiful. And I just think that they're going to look for the place that has the most peaceful vibe about it because that's what people are going to want to go and, and feel the, the comfort of, of a beautiful scene and, uh, and, and trees are, I don't know about any of you all, but I just love trees. I need to be around trees. Trees are the most comforting, wonderful thing. Um, and they have an abundance of them out there. So it's very, very important for healing for the community and for the students. And just also to these students are immortal now. They'll never be forgotten. And this is just a place that will help make that possible. And I think it's very important for the community and for the University of Idaho Vandal family. Interesting you say that. Uh, I don't like to think about it, but when my dad uh, was very sick in the last bunch of months, his nursing home had, uh, my mom and I called it the elephant tree. It was the biggest tree you've ever seen in your life. We used to go out there. <laughs> and uh, look like a giant elephant, and it would bring us comfort just to hang out, watch yes. little feral cats running uh, around on the tree. <laughs> um, Karen Bushell says, Joel, that sounds like a Leonard Cohen reference. There is a crack <laughs> in everything. That's how the light gets in. Uh, that's why he's a amazing songwriter. Um, so there's two other victims in this, Jay Ruben Appleman, and of course are the sur surviving roommates. Don't really like to mention the names, per se, because I don't want negative attention thrown their way, but it's DM and BF. Um, I think you reached out or spoke to one of the of, of their family members. Uh, they're obviously caught in the middle of all this. They um, are living to see future days, but they will be forever scarred by this. Right, Jay Rubin? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I said Scott, uh, Steve Laramie earlier. Uh, it's Scott. Scott Laramie is is Maddie's stepfather's name. Um, but um, yeah, I spoke to the the father of of one of them, um, and uh, actually, I'll, I'll tell you what what he said. But there's an update on that uh, uh, apparently, which I di I didn't know about till today. That um, 
but I, I at the time that I spoke to him, um, you know, she was um, being protected by uh, uh, her family pretty greatly. She was she was uh, staying inside. She had the spiritual community around her uh, that was part of her community, and um, she was doing some online gaming with friends. But that was pretty much it. Uh, it I'm assuming this is accurate reporting, but you never know. The New York Post, I think it is, and the Daily Mail today, um, I think it's today, said that uh, she is transferred to another school. Um, they, they got a hold of, um, I, probably after I mentioned uh, that I had spoken to her father, um, they started tracking down on her father's side, I guess, and got a hold of an ex-stepmother who says that she is transferred to another school. Um, but obviously both of these, both of these uh, victims surviving victims um you know there's all there's a lot of eyeballs on them for sure uh uh they're, they they have information a lot or a little um in one instance it appears to be a lot in another instance it appears to be a little but um, we don't really know till the trial um and that's intentional and that's good right um we're not supposed to know everything before before a uh, a murder trial um i think it's i i appreciate the fact that nobody is talking um I think you need to protect what you have if you want to try this perpetrator in a in a way that succeeds, right? Um, but or this alleged perpetrator. But um, but uh, yeah, they're basically in hiding and with a lot of protection. Uh, I, I can't imagine the number of people that do know where they are who are trying to get a hold of them. Um, how how horrific that is to relive uh, the 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 murder of your your closest friends over and over again, every time somebody calls you on the phone, every time somebody sees you at the gas station and recognizes you. Um, it's a really troubling thing for sure. Um, I hope that they're doing well. I can't imagine that they are doing great, but it, it, at least you can hope that maybe they found a way to get through through the days for sure. Yeah, and uh, I've heard that DM is not doing fantastic, although she's starting to come around a little bit from reporting that I've uh, read but obviously she's going through um, trauma therapy as she should be and is having a really uh, difficult time as expected. So um, we sort of started off on campus. Uh, we will end there. Um, Linda, to you, I mean, you work at the school. Um, what's it like to just walk through campus? What will it be like for you to go to school tomorrow? Well, you know, I, I carry on and I, it's a, I, I enjoy my job and I enjoy everyone I work with and I enjoy the beautiful young people. I, I enjoy the academic environment. There's always a, a that feeling that I kind of hold in the grief that I feel, but I, I do see, you know, people carrying on with their lives and, and it's the, the, the environment on campus is actually a comforting environment. It's a nice thing. And I know, I know a lot of people when this happened a year ago, a lot of people dropped out and left and and thought, okay, well, now Idaho, Moscow, Idaho is becoming high crime. I'm going to say as a Moscow native, no, it isn't. We are never going to be a high crime city. I still think Moscow is a safe, wonderful place. Um, I lock my doors at night, but I do anyway. But I just double check them more now. Um, but it, it's, it, I think people mostly feel safe on campus. They've beefed up a lot of campus security it's always been good, but I think they beefed it up even more and they reached out to students. And you, I noticed a lot more presence of security personnel on campus. I mean, they were very like um, obvious and, and uh, you know, conspicuously showing themselves to be on campus because I think they wanted students to feel safe and not be afraid to come back to class. I think sometimes, you know, when you go through a traumatic event, you want to withdraw for a while, but at some point you want to come back, reconnect with people, pick back up again. Maybe you take a, a semester off, but you just, you need to live your life. And it feels good sometimes to get back in that swing. And, you know, the, the memorial will be a really nice coming together event for, for students on campus and people that are still grieving and feeling these things. Um, but I, I just, I look forward to going to work tomorrow and talking to people and, and seeing all the faces. And I, I don't, I'm going to be ugly crying tomorrow night, I'm sure, but, but it's okay. You know, people, I think it helps to, to have that touchstone of being with people who share this experience and to let your emotions out. And it's, 
cathartic to do that. And I think it's very important. So um, that's the way I feel about it. I'm I'm looking forward to a new day tomorrow when the sun coming up and 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 another day and hope, you know. That's what I'm looking forward to. Well said, uh, Cindy. If you could speak to the uh, victims' families tonight uh, on the eve of this memorial, what would you say to them? <laughs> First, I just wanted to make a. I wanted to make Amanda feel okay. Um, there was talk about the memorial being um, at the house at eleven twenty-two um, uh, Healing Garden, right there. I remember when they said that. It's still up in the air where that's going to be. So, Amanda, just so you know that, like, you weren't imagining something. Because I hate when that happens to me. So, I just wanted to clear that up. Um, I, I, you know, um, if I could say anything to their families, uh, it's one of those things where I don't think words really do any good. It's like, if I could, I would just hug every one of them. And say, like, I don't know what to say, so I just want to hug you. You know? Because saying things like sorry or what what do you say? Keep your keep keep going. Like, so I would just like to like if I if I had the ability to send out like what I feel in my heart to each of them, some kind of telepathically, it would just be like, gosh, just I would just be sending, you know, hugs and healing and the best because what they're going through is just, it's unimaginable pain, you know, and, and I'm um, hope for um, that whoever did this is brought to justice because um, I think it was Amanda who said it and uh, Kaylee's mom said it one night, they, they were doing everything right. There's no reason this ever should have happened. They're just people living their lives. I mean, that's that's the best I can say, you know. Uh, that's that's enough. Don Hagerman, friend of the show. I hope the memorial is live streamed. Um, the COE, maybe she'll look into that. If it is being live streamed, we maybe we'll be able to put it on to uh, STS. So uh, follow me at podcast STS. So we'll update you on that tomorrow at podcast STS on Twitter. And on Instagram, we're at Surviving the Survivor. Uh, interesting. I didn't even uh, think about that, but there is a chance that it will be live streamed uh, from the university site. So um, if they are doing that and we're able to take it, uh, we will put it on Surviving the Survivor uh, tomorrow night. Uh, Jay Ruben Appleman, someone was asking if they can get your book in Australia. Is that a possibility? That's a good question. I don't know the answer, to be honest with you. I know that it's... Uh... Uh, that's a really good question. I'll find out. It might be the same. I think somebody asked me on Facebook and I never answered because I didn't know the answer. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think they said that they tried and they could get a hard copy cover, but they couldn't get it uh, in any other form. So I'll have you let me know and I'll tweet that out as tell well. Them. Yeah. Tell, the, tell, the, tell them and anybody else if they have questions like that, they can find my social or send me an email through my uh, website. It's just my name, J. Ruben Appleman, and, uh, and I'll find out the answers to that stuff. Ned Smith asking if it's on audible. So yeah, hit up Jay Rubin and uh, he will be uh, happy to answer those questions. Jay Rubin, what's your plan for tomorrow? Um, you came in from Boise, but what are you, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be around the neighborhood, uh, the King road residence and also on campus. Uh, I'm trying to talk to some people. Um, if you see me and you're there and you want to talk, come talk to me. Um, I'm doing some follow-up work about the case. And, um, you know, it's funny. I, I got to say, since people talk about the book, and I appreciate I saw the comments, people saying I, I read the book, and it's excellent stuff. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you putting the, the thing up about the book every once in a while. You'll put post the cover, I mean. Um, but really, um, it also feels a little um, heavy when I see that because um, I, I know that uh, – it can sometimes appear that people are are, pitch, are hawking items uh, in the face of uh, tragic events. You know, that's really not my intent. Um, I hope the book speaks for itself when people read it. That it's a really honest, ethical 
uh, treatment of, of, of the information and respectful of the families and everything. And, and I don't feel comfortable hawking the book, but I, I do appreciate that people are reading it. And um, if, if you do want to talk to me about the book ever, you can just contact me. But thank you for, uh, for talking about it as much as you have on, on this episode. Yeah. And thank you, Jay Rubin. Uh, there were people who were a little, uh, fearful, apprehensive before I had you on. But after I had you on as a guest on a recent episode, people were like, that is a good dude. And I have to agree, uh, with, um, only good motives behind him. And, uh, it's important to tell these stories. And that's what Jay Rubin did. The book is while Idaho slept. Last question goes to the most recent university of Idaho graduate. And that is Amanda who graduated in 2021. And it's simple. What are you going to do, do tomorrow? And how are you going to remember these four victims? You know, I was planning on getting some flowers, dropping them off at King Road in front of the residence and joining uh, actually my brother on the admin lawn with the rest of the students because my brother is a student as well. Um, he's a younger student, so it, it really hits hard how much the Vandal community is a family. You know, I have a family member in the Vandals and, you know, Ethan Chapin had his siblings. I don't know if they're going to be there or not, but we're all a family. We're all a unit. We're a whole, uh, the Moscow community, the Vandal community. And so I plan on being there tomorrow afternoon. Um, if you can't make it there tomorrow afternoon, there is, uh, if turning on the light on your front porch from six to seven in honor of the victims. So just want everyone to keep that in mind. If you can't be there and you want to be there, you want to show signs of respect, that's something you can do. So hmm. that's interesting. The people are turning their lights on from six to seven. Is that what you said? Well, we'll have to do that in our little community. So uh, COE, remember that we will turn on our light. It is dark enough now. Um, to do that tomorrow night, just a very quick programming note, we're going to do another show on Moscow, but we're going to focus a little more on the legal side, uh, where the investigation stands and 7 PM local time in Moscow would make it 10 PM Eastern time. And if we're able to, we will try to stream, uh, the Memorial tribute live to you, the COE, COE, and I will discuss that. Steve Cohen, otherwise known as Meve Moen, is working on assembling a great panel tomorrow night. We've got Tara Malik, uh, Idaho attorney, and I think Gene Fisher, who's one of the longest serving prosecutors in the state, coming on. And we will discuss some of the legal aspects revolving around this case. And then Tuesday, uh, we are going to be back with some more of the uh, Charlie Adelson trial. We're going to have Ryan Fitzpatrick on, one of Charlie Adelson's former best friends. He's going to tell all about Charlie Adelson, who was just convicted of murder and a murder for hire plot against his ex-brother-in-law. Until then, love you, America, and love you, Moscow, Idaho. You're in our thoughts. 